Uh, that's awesome. So we got a, a question in our chat, and it was about the sessions that we've done this past week and where those might be available. That was a perfect question, Tanya. Thanks for asking. Makes a good sort of segue. Um, but uh, so we did a couple sessions this week. We did one about the little bot, and then we did one about moving masterpieces as well. And um, we went live to Facebook um, for both of those, I believe, as we're going live to Facebook today. Um, and so those are available on Facebook, and they will be available on YouTube um, probably this evening. Um, we just had to do a little bit of editing of the raw footage before we put it up on YouTube to make it sound good and look good and everything. Um, those of you getting it live on Facebook, get what you get. Um, <laughs> so, but the YouTube gets a little, little editing cleanup for it. Um, but what we were trying to do in those sessions this week is we were trying to like do about half of the session or 40 minutes of the hour long session of a, just a maker activity. Oops, sorry, little bot, didn't mean to knock you over. So we, um, on Tuesday, we made this little guy. So we made sort of a non-robotic version of the little bot. So we made, this is a little bot that's made with a paper towel tube, um, some boxes. This is a English breakfast tea box and a Toast and Pop-Ups box, which is the Dollar Tree version of Pop-Tarts. <laughs> um, but then, and a pencil to go through the head, so it's got a little mechanism there. But we wanted to kind of make a non-robotic version, and then the participants could do some remote coding and could code the robotic version. So if I turn this here a little bit, and I think it's this one. Yeah, there it is. Oop, wrong way. So I've coded this one to do a couple different things. I'm, I'm running it on an iPad here, and I'll show you the code for it in a second. But when I hit some different buttons on the micro bit, it looks different ways. So it's looking around, it's looking up and over, it's looking down and to the side. Or if I hit the A and B button at the same time, it does sort of a, it kind of looks front, <laughs> kind of. I could code that better. Um, you might have ideas for how I could code that better, but it looks straight. But I also, if I stop that code for a second, I also wrote another little code because I think one of the coolest things with LittleBot is the build is the same. The build can, can be, and there's a, a tutorial that we'll show you in just a minute, and Matt's gonna pull that up for me on the side. Um, there's a tutorial that'll show you how to build this little bot. It's just, it's got a couple of motors in there, one motor that controls the back and forth motor motion, and one motor that controls the up and down. You kind of glue one motor onto another, it's pretty slick. Um, but with this same build, well, what do you want it to do? You can code it to do a bunch of different things. So I've, uh, if I initiate this other code, I've actually got it so that as I tilt my hummingbird with the micro bit in it, I'm actually puppeting it to look back and forth as I tilt it on this plane. So if we wanna take a look at the code that's running that, I'll zoom way in on it and we'll take a look, let's see, here, and I'll bring this guy here so we can see him in front of me. And then I'll zoom way in here and take the glare off. So this code that I'm running right here is showing that the accelerometer, when, it's, uh, when the accelerometer is bigger than zero, then the position servo is going to match that accelerometer value times 20 because the accelerometer goes from negative 10 to positive 10. So I want it to be able to run the whole 180 degree range of the servo motor. Now this code isn't like great, it's not perfect, it's kind of skippy, it's kind of jumpy, but you could mess with it and try a bunch of different things with it. But this is using the accelerometer in the micro bit which can tell when, when it's being tilted on an X or a Y axis, and it's using that to control the to control the position of the position servo, the angle of the position servo. So again, you could write much better code than that, but that's one of the things one of the things that I really love about this little bot project with the same um, build. And I'll sh I'll take you there now to show you what that looks like with the same build. You can turn it into a bunch of different projects, and I think the little bot. I'll ask you guys. Where, where might you use, uh, I'll show you the web page, but then I'll ask some of you teachers, where might the little bot as a project be appropriate in what kind of class or context or larger project? So let me show you on our website what I'm doing here. I'll come back over here and resize it a little bit so that you can see the whole thing. There we go. And so this little bot project, we've got this tutorial that shows you how to, how to build it here. 
So this is on our build page, or you can always go to search and you can type in LittleBot. But we've broken up the steps for how to build this into, all right, here's all the tools you're going to need. We have some suggested craft supplies and such. We've got um, step one, get a couple boxes, put them together, right? Step two, you're going to cut the flaps off of one of the boxes. And so um, these, are, these are Matt's hands. You only ever really hear Matt's voice. His face is a, is a mystery. But um, you see his hands in all these, all these tutorials. So he takes you through step by step, you know, how to, how to cut a hole to insert the motor down into part of the robot. Um, all the way to at the end here, all right, you've got a spacer in there. You're going to put a little hot glue on there. You're going to glue the head on to the side. And so that's what he's doing here. There's a the head, you know. So we, sh we show you step by step. So you don't have to know exactly how to build a little bot. You could send your students here. Now, there is text along the side, but the text is not really necessary. The text is just there in case you're, like, completely confused by what you're seeing on screen. But it's, it's designed so that you can just watch and follow along, which is great for students who don't speak English as their first language, students who um, aren't great readers yet for whatever reason, or students who are behind in language development. Um, 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 getting close with a lady uh, who works with um, students who are hard of hearing. And so they use sign language and they're often a little bit behind in their language acquisition skills. There's no talking in these. So you don't need, there's no translating, there's no closed captions. They work for a lot of different students. Um, so uh, if I can ask you teachers for a minute, um, as far as this little bot project goes, what ideas does this spark for you? Or where would you use a project like this in your classrooms that you teach in, STEM, gifted, middle school, and elementary, et cetera. Does anybody have any ideas? Yeah, Tanya. Well, I plan to do something similar before uh, we got out of school. We just finished reading The Wild Robot, and we were going to create a story, a robotic story, based on um, that robot, but it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So, so can you, but, people uh, use that book, The Wild Robot, all the time. Can you talk a little bit about what that book is? It's, it's about a robot, basically, that um, he's, he's basically dropped off on this island, and then he lives on the island with the animals, and he basically learns how to speak their language. <laughs> and then he basically somehow, um, they, they, come, the, they come searching for him because they know he's lost and okay. he's taken back into the real world. And it's a, it's an awesome story. It's one of my favorite, we don't, this is my, one of my favorite stories to read to kids, but it's just about, it's, an, it's about robotics. It, it talks about how this lady developed him and mm. how he came to be, but it's an awesome story. That's cute. And it's a, is it a picture book? Is that right? No, it's a oh. chapter book. Oh, it's a chapter it's book. Like a, it's a chapter book. It's a two series book. Cute. Okay. I, you know, I, I haven't read it, uh, obviously. Uh, and I, my, <laughs> it sounds like I would. That's awesome. So how would the little bot or the, or a design or something similar to that, what were you planning to do to engage the I little bot in the wild robot? I planned on making the wild robot and have maybe a scene from the book come to life, um, yeah. for comprehension. I always try to add some art and some robotics to whatever I do just to tie it in. So no one says, what are you doing in the classroom? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> right. What are these robots here for? Aren't you supposed yeah. to be reading? <laughs> Listen, we're building the same skills. We're talking about sequencing, and we're talking exactly. about character development and all this all this jazz, you know? Um, yeah, I, I feel that very much. Um, uh, Matt has for us, uh, yeah. is this the, the um, I cover? I'm just yeah, no. Um, Matt, is this this is the yeah, cover okay. of the Wild Robot? Yeah, so that's the the cover that we're talking about of the of the book. It's it's a uh, so many teachers use this book. I think it's a great way. It sounds like to talk about like um, you could talk about artificial intelligence. You could talk yeah. about a animal adaptations. You could tie that into the robot petting zoo project, or you could make your little bot into the Wild Robot. And I loved what you were saying of making um, uh, doing like a uh, a, um, a project uh, about bringing a scene to life. There's a lot of different ways that um, I've seen teachers do that. Basically, if you've got an idea for a diorama, you could make it move, you know? So that's a great way. Maybe each group gets a different scene. There's a great robot Shakespeare project on our, on our website um, where each group 
reading Romeo and Juliet got a different scene and they had to bring it to life with like motors and lights and buzzers and things like that. And so, and they had to record themselves reading the dialogue and then they had to sync up the scene that they programmed with the dialogue that they themselves had recorded, which was like, ugh, so cool. Um, but that's a, a, what you were saying about like bringing a scene from a book to life. Little Bot could be great for that, but also you could just sort of expand it. Like you've got to make a shoebox diorama and make it make it move or something too. Um, did you guys have any other ideas that you wanted to share about how a Little Bot or something similar would work in your in your classroom or how you might be able to how you might see that going? Um, I've seen a lot of after school programs use this as sort of like. Um, maybe a first or a second robot. I really liked Aaron's example of like, give them a cup and some tape and scissors and markers and 30 minutes as their first one. But maybe when they, when you start talking about building techniques and things, you need a couple of building techniques in order to be able to, uh, to run that uh, or to build this, excuse me. So um, yeah, the idea, uh, the idea being like, let's all make something together and then put your own spin on it. Like I've seen so many versions of this little bot. I made one into, Harry Potter one time, you could like give it some crazy like pipe cleaner hair, you could make it into a character from a book, you could make it a self portrait, you could make it a biography project, like you can take this like little humanoid thing and anything you can do with sculpture or with um, portraiture you can do with robots now and get it to, to sync things up there. So yeah. Um, somebody had been specifically asking about um, about uh, the Moving Masterpieces project as well. So let me grab really quick my um, Mona Lisa prototype. Unfortunately, I left it in a shelf off to the side. But while I'm grabbing that, um, let's see. Did anybody have other questions, things they wanted to cover? And I can hear you, I just have to, oh, can you grab that for me, Matt? Matt's gonna grab it for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, does anybody have other things that they wanted to cover during our, we're about halfway through during our hour today. I know we want to talk about programming a little bit and um, there was one other thing. Um, I know I want to look forward to next week's as well, but any other questions that you guys are coming in with? I would. Uh, yeah, I'll go to Regina and then to you, Tana. Okay. Yeah, Regina. What is the best way that you think for starting uh, students off with introducing the hummingbird kits in the classroom? Um, that is a great question and I have like 10 answers. Um, I think um, the, the, the best way, though, is to just start them with maybe one or two components and give them a fun project to do with it. So teach them like a single color LED and a motor, and then you could do the Bee Waggle Dance project. We have a lesson plan that goes with that. You could search Bee Waggle. Um, uh, do you guys know, by the way, what, like the Bee Waggle Dance is a, is a thing in nature. Has anybody ever heard of that before? No? Tanya's like, it's ringing a bell. I see. It does. <laughs> so in nature, bees, the way they talk to each other, they don't have vocal cords. They can't sing songs. Uh, they can move. And so the way that bees communicate to each other is through dance, which is also sometimes how we communicate to each other, right? But what they do is a bee goes out and it fl finds a flower or a field of flower that has some good nectar in it that they could go and bring back and make into honey. And so to communicate with the other bees, it comes back to the hive, it climbs up on the backs of its sisters and it vibrates its abdomen to get everybody's attention, like you do. And so then it like clears the dance floor and then it does this little dance. And so if you're watching it from the top, this will be the bee. It wiggles and it moves forward and then it turns around like this and then it wiggles and moves forward and then it turns around like this and it does this little figure eight motion. And how long it wiggles, the angle at which it dances can communicate what direction and how far flowers are away with like really accurate information for the other bees. I think in the video that goes with this lesson plan, it's up to six kilometers away because he's British. Um, so like it can pinpoint the location of nectar sources a long ways away. So uh, there's like a three minute video that goes with it. I think um, Matt is gonna pull up that lesson plan so we can look at it. Um, and so there's uh, um, the, the, what the kids do is they watch this little three minute video and then they make a little styrofoam ball version of a bee and they smoosh an LED in there and, it's, uh, and it makes it light up and then they glue it to a motor and they can make it wiggle. And so I'm gonna go over to that 
I'm gonna take a look at that screen. This is what the Be Waggle Dance lesson plan looks like. That's okay, I know. It, it, <laughs> uh, next one, that one, yeah. So this is what the Be Waggle Dance lesson plan looks like. It's got some suggested teaching time. It's got some suggested materials that you might gather to have in your classroom. Here's the hardware that you should use. Talks a little bit about um, computational thinking, um, a little bit. Um, and then it goes into the actual like lesson plan itself. So how to prepare the room and materials, what um, you're gonna need these like tutorials, the single color LED and the position servo, you're gonna need those from our website. But this is a fully thought out lesson plan for what to do that first day when you're teaching robotics. And there's a couple different projects you could do. You could do the bee waggle, that's a fun one. I really like the tiny drummer as well, if we can pull that up. Yeah, I'll go back to that screen. So the tiny drummer, uh, Matt's gonna click on it. I just think it's so funny. It just makes me laugh every time. So this one reminds me a little bit of Aaron's first day project because it's like, all right, you need some cardboard and a cup and a popsicle stick. You're, you're good, you're done, you got all your materials. And then you get the kids to sync up the drumming on the cup with their favorite song. Every kid has a favorite song, or every group of kids has a favorite song, whether it's like, Old Town Road or Mary Had a Little Lamb or whatever they think would be funny. It starts from this place of like delight, which I think is just such a great place to start a project from. And it gives them a little bit more like choice and freedom, but it still is, it takes five, maybe 10 minutes to build a tiny drummer. And then you get to play with the coding of it. And it lets it, it introduces concepts like what is a weight block and how does the position servo mood so it move? So it's teaching along with it, but it's a great introductory project. Um, and then one more really funny introductory project. If you can go to Twitter, Matt, and go to my Twitter and search hashtag cutlery character. If you're logged into Twitter, I can see that. Yeah, well, even if, we'll see if I'm logged into Twitter. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, uh, if you go to Twitter and you search at Kelsey Connects, and then hashtag cutlery character. Oh my gosh. So this is one of the things we do at our bots and bevs events, which are robots and beverages. So we like take our robots and a six pack holder full of craft supplies to like a brewery or a Mexican cantina or wherever. And teachers show up and they can just build a robot and have a beverage of their choice while we're building robots and cutlery characters are some of the funniest things. I'm gonna go back and we're gonna take a look at that. So this one is a Yoda cutlery character. He's so funny. Um, what other ones are on there? Uh, scrolling yeah, through. scrolling through and oh, you can just find things on my, it'll be back a little ways. <laughs> it's been a little while since I've done a bots and bevs. We usually do them on the road and I uh, haven't been on the road <laughs> so much lately. <laughs> yeah, uh, once we find another one, let me know. But yeah, the. The bots and the, the cutlery characters is a really fun one too. All you need is plastic cutlery and tape. Yeah, she's got it. Regina's like, I All found right. it. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody knows how to use Twitter. I've been following you for a while. <laughs> well, it, the, I'm glad. Thank you. That's great. Um, but yeah, I'm always posting like funny tiny drummer or like hashtag tiny drummer, hashtag cutlery character, um, hashtag RPZ for robot petting zoo. Um, whatever projects I'm doing with teachers, I try to take pictures and videos and then post that. And then BirdBrain retweets them too. So, um, I saw a little while ago, and I'm sorry, I'm just getting to you, Erin. Um, I saw you had your hand up a little while ago. What, yeah, what did you want to say? Yeah, I just want to say, um, to, she had a question about like first starting out if you haven't done this. Um, yeah. One of the things that I've done is I've used uh, BirdBrain's resources online. Uh, kind of like what you were saying with the robots, but even the ones where they, if you select the specific codes, like we're using make code, mm -hmm. it actually will go through, here's how to use and set up the color LED. And it's all on the computer, so I, the students can work at their own pace, which is nice, and then I'm just going around making sure that they're putting in the, uh, the, the chords the right way, making sure that they understand like what the S and plus and minus and stuff like that are for. So even before building a robot, um, that could be an option for students that are brand new to it is using that resource as well. Yeah, and for you as a teacher, I'll, I'll show you that, um, just the site. Like if you go to the basic Bird Brain Technologies site, if you go to Get Started, that purple button there, this is what Aaron was talking about. So this is where you select, I'll deselect things so you can see all the options. You select the robot that you've got in front of you. So like, I've got a hummingbird bit. 
you select the device that you have to work with. So at my school, we have iPads, or at my school, we have Chromebooks, etc. So, for example, Regina, what kind of technology do you guys have at your school? I do you have some? I have all of that. I have some iPads, I do have some <laughs> Chromebooks and PCs. Okay. Uh, wh just for argument's sake, which one do you want to choose off of here? Uh, an iPad. An iPad, okay. I'm going to take the mouse back, Matt. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'm going to do iPad, and then it shows you what language works with that device. So if you have an iPad, you'll be using Bird Blocks. If, for example, I had selected Mac, it says, oh, you can do MakeCode or Snap or Python or Java. It tells you what language to do. So I'll go with iPad. We'll hit Bird Blocks, and then you go to Get Started, and then it opens up these like four buckets of information. Programming tutorials, building tutorials, teaching or project inspiration ideas, and then printable resources. So the tutorials that we were talking about, the wordless, soundless tutorials, those are all in the project, or in, I'm sorry, in the programming tutorials page. So these are all little modules here that take you from how to set up your hummingbird, to work with your iPad or um, smartphone or Kindle or whatever Bluetooth enabled tablet device you have works the same. Um, so, so how to set it up, and then like how to use single color LEDs. So we have like how to plug them in. That's one. You can just follow along. You don't have to read it. How to, which blocks to drag out on bird blocks. There's a little finger coming in there and showing you exactly how to, how to do all that. Um, we give a little side by side. This is one of my favorite ones. Like a side by side of the code running with the thing working. So you can see how that code is affecting the thing. And then the last one is always a little challenge. So in this one, it says, write a program that makes the LED blink faster. And it doesn't give them the answer, but if they've gone through it, you can kind of figure that out. But it gives them a little challenge there. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Aaron. That's a, a great place to start, too. It kind of depends. Like, do you want them to start by like kind of knowing how everything works? Do you want to kind of just like toss them in the deep end with some floaties, the floaties being these tutorials, and just be like, you'll figure it out, go. Like, you know, I think there's a, it depends on your teaching style. And we tried to make tutorials that can support a bunch of different teaching styles. So I think the question that you just asked though, Regina, Regina, where do I start? Is the question that most people ask. So I'm really glad that you asked it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, too. That's, that is great. And I think it's not the teaching style, per se. It's my students. Some <laughs> students too. want step by step, and some I can throw them the materials and say, figure it out. So it's yeah. really them. But this is, this is perfect. Thank you. Great. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And there's, um, there's some research that I tend to share when I do professional development. Um, and I, I don't have uh, the graph handy, but it's a graph where on the x-axis, it tracks how much support is given in the classroom from like completely open-ended like just like here's a robot go for it to like um inquiry based which is like you've got a project ahead of you you've got the robot petting zoo project ahead of you and you've got to get a light and a motor and a sensor to work together but you kind of get to decide what success looks like in that to um direct instruction step-by-step -step instructions and then on the y-axis over here it tracks student motivation to learn and it compares boys' motivation to learn and girls' motivation to learn. So this is just two groups that it's tracking. But both groups are not super motivated with that super open-ended thing, just like here's a robot, figure out what to do with it, because they don't know what the goal is. What are we, what are we supposed to be doing? How do I know if I did it? They don't know that. But as you give them a little bit more support and get them to that inquiry-based learning, man, both boys and girls love to learn that way. They love to have a goal. They love to know when they are successful without you check marking something, right? Like, they, did the mouth move? Yes, you did it. Congratulations, you don't need me to tell you that, right? It, it did what you wanted it to do. So that inquiry-based learning, they're both really engaged. And then when you get to the direct instruction, boys' motivation to learn comes off a little bit, and girls' motivation to learn tanks. And so when you think about how computer science has had to be taught in the past, it kind of had to be taught in direct instruction. If you're teaching your kids Python, if you miss a slash in Python, your code's broken and it throws an error code and that error code can mean like 14 different things and you really have to know Python to be able to even troubleshoot it. And so in order to teach that, you've got to say, do this, 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 and this, no, not that, yes, this, no, we're not on our phones, no, we're not asking questions, you have to do this. And that kind of works for boys, 
but it really doesn't work for girls. So when people ask, like, why aren't there more girls in, in computer science? Like, there are more and more girls in computer science, but there is still a huge gap there. And it's not because girls aren't good at it. I'm here to tell you that. I don't think any of us here would think that. I think part of it, and I think there are a lot of different reasons, but I think the part of it is, well, how are you teaching it? We had to teach it a certain way, but now we have new tools. We have block-based programming where, like, you can snap some blocks together and see like, whoop, nope, that didn't work, that didn't work at all. And so you can just move the blocks around. We have tools like the Hummingbird and the Microbit and the Finch where you can see if it worked and like, oh, nope, that didn't work. I just got to replug it in. You don't have to re-solder it. You know, like it, it makes a, a, so many things more tinkerable and things like block-based coding and tools like the Hummingbird and the Finch and others make both the programming and the making tinkerable. <laughs> It makes it so you can tinker with things and just see what works. And you're able to do that. You're not going to electrocute yourself if you put it in wrong. You know, the worst thing will, that'll happen if you plug it in wrong is it just won't work. Which, like, man, what a load off of my mind as an educator. No sparks, no fires. Hooray. Only fires of the soul. That's, <laughs> that's what we're going for. That was hokey, but I appreciate you guys smiling and nodding. That was That's kind of you. <laughs> um... Well, let's take a look at moving masterpieces. You want to? Because we did that one on Thursday. So just to look at that, um, well, what we did on Thursday, we've done two versions of moving masterpieces now. So I'm going to go to the one we did this week. We took a look at famous works of art. Uh, can anyone tell what famous work of art this is attempting to be? you got to unmute yourself, though. Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. Thank you. You're very generous. I appreciate you, uh -huh. Tina. <laughs> yes, this is my take on Mona Lisa. But when I move this tab back and forth, her eyes look around a little bit. And so this was our non-robotic version of this project. So on the back, you can see this is just a tab of paper with some pupils drawn on it. And the, these pieces of tape are sort of keeping it on a track so it can move back and forth. But then we took a look at how to turn, and we took inspiration from pop-up books in this, by the way. Like, how can we, how could we make a pop-up book into a robot? I'm going to grab Mona Lisa off the back, um, off my back shelf here, and we'll take a look at how she's made. Okay. So this project is uh, deceptively simple. The thing that took forever was, like, making the painting which is perhaps how it should be. <laughs> it's, it's art after all. Um, I'm gonna steal this battery pack so I can power it. But um, if we take a look at how Mona Lisa works, she was coded with, uh, so as you saw before, I was coding um, the little bot live on my iPad, but this one was coded with make code. Um, excuse me, so this, uh, this one, uh, it's running, it's not plugged into anything, it's not attached to anything. This one, the, pro the, the program was made in make code and then downloaded onto the robot, which is great for like display purposes. Um, Bird Blocks is great for live programming. If you're wanting to mess with stuff, it's instantaneous. This one, it takes five seconds to download the program, so it's not like you have to let it like render like a video or anything like that. It takes five seconds to download. But the cool thing about make code is you download it onto the board and then it just, it just works. So if we take a look at how Mona Lisa's eyes work here, the other way, there we go. So here's Mona Lisa's eyes, and they're just moving back and forth slightly. Actually, when they get to the edges of her eyes, they, look, they get a little, ooh. But <laughs> I, could, I could remake her a little bit better. But if we look inside how it's made, here's a motor poking through the back. So here's the hummingbird, the battery pack. And here's the motor kind of poking through. And if I turn it to the side, you can see it's actually heavily layered. So you can see there's that motor right there. And then this, this piece right here, my hand's blocking it. This piece in the middle here, that is just a circle of cardboard that I drew the, the pupils on. And as that circle of cardboard moves, that is what, as that circle of cardboard turns, that's what's moving her pupils back and forth. So it's, it's a really simple design. Anybody can make that. You can probably make it better than me, actually. <laughs> but we were just, um, you know, thinking about how to bring a, a moving work of art to life. But that original project was from um, Jane Sweet. She's a, an art teacher 
in South Allegheny, I believe. And she started doing this project years ago with hummingbirds. She had like the original hummingbirds, like before the duo was out, like the, the beta version of the hummingbirds. And she's still rocking them. They're still going, man. She's like, she's taking care of her stuff. She, they're still rocking. Um, she has to get some new motors every now and again. But, um, but she, she did this project with her students and it was a way for her to get her students to engage with like art history. Because like kids like to draw, they like to make art, but how do you get them interested in like famous art? Some kids are just like, mm, yes, I love Degas, but like not every kid <laughs> just like engages with <laughs> impressionism, you know, some kids do. But you know, so one of the starting places that she talked about when we did Moving Masterpieces a couple weeks ago, she said, you know, she just asked the kids like, what do you, what's something you like? You know, and she'll get some, some kids who are like, oh, I really like sports. I love being on my soccer team. And she goes, great. And she knows so many different artists. So she would send them to, I forget the guy's name, but there was a, um, a, f a famous artist who does like these like sports paintings, paintings of people doing sports. And so she was like, pick one of those, bring it to life, you know. But then she'd get the kooky kids who are like, I'm doing Andy Warhol. Like, yeah, kid, make a soup can interesting. He did it. You should do it too, you know? But we, I mean, I think it really allows us to talk about like the nature of art and the nature of like remixing something or plagiarism and what is art and what, and it's just like, ooh, what deep discussions they got into because they were making robots of famous works of art. Um, but really, I think that could be true for. Um, for if, if teachers are looking for a way, this is one of the things that I also recommend in the PD that I teach of like, what's your least favorite unit that you teach? <laughs> like, what do you really struggle to get kids engaged with? And how could you put robotics into that? So um, I had a teacher who was telling me that um, getting, doing the hypotenuse project, like, or doing the hypotenuse lesson of like getting kids to find um, does anybody, and if you do, unmute yourself. Does anybody remember the, the uh, formula for finding the hypotenuse of a right triangle? If you do, uh, you get a virtual cookie. Does anybody remember? Stacy's like, mm, it's close by. I know it, but I'm not going to be the... No, do it, do it. We like brilliant kid. We like brilliant students. Be the brilliant student. What is it, Stacy? Like when you're, when all, all these lessons, okay, you know, you know, all these lessons, um, you know, when you're teaching these kids, they're all relevant to these physical computing activities. Yeah. And um, so for me, like I was going to chime in earlier, yeah. it's, um, uh, the, the, I, I don't want to say I'm like the girls, because I actually have girls that are like just off the charts creative so. with just some, you know, some string and some glue and some paper. Yeah. But I'm one of those kids that's challenged if I don't have the, the parameters. Um, and so um, all these lessons that, that you guys already have in there, and I was just, I've been Googling up all the resources you've been suggesting and bookmarking your Code Joy and things like that. Um, <laughs> Thanks. And so even if you don't feel currently creative, you can be creative with these tools and teach your math lessons and teach your language arts lessons you can do storytelling or do basic math topics and things like that i just watched um uh ben cogswell teach um kinder um you know basic edition with a stop motion uh, movie and um they made he and his daughter made it with a with a document camera in the front room and so i like how you bring in all the other topics into this because um would you grab it, the box puppet for me please matt to what the kids are learning thanks yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that, Stacia. That means a lot. Like, that's our, our whole project page on the Bird Brain website is all about, you know, I, I think um, some teachers, some people, I'll say just generally people, some people are just like, they've got a million creative ideas and they can do all kinds of things. But, like, I want to support the teacher to get out of their wheelhouse a little bit, the teacher who wants to try something new and isn't sure where to start. Like, if you're looking to just, like, bring some creativity into your classroom, you know, robots may not be the first thing that, that someone thinks of when they think of getting creative, but I think it really, it can be, you know? So if, if robotics, if making, um, if programming can be a, a, an avenue for a teacher to try something new and feel supported, that's what that project page is all about. It's got over 60 different projects that real teachers have done in their classrooms 
Um, everything from like amusement park physics, robot Shakespeare, um, exploring tectonic plates, um, you know, all, all kinds of things like that. Um, it's just a, a total, total, uh, I, when, I, when I was first using Hummingbird, that project page didn't exist as it currently does. And I remember just being like, you know, anything, any, anything is a lot of choices. Like anything might actually be too many choices for me, <laughs> you know? So it was good to just like get some ideas to ground my thinking when I was, when I was teaching it. So um, somebody had asked a question in chat that people might have a, a question about at home. I've been talking a, a lot about the hummingbird bit and the, the finch too, but for anybody who has duos, we are not phasing out our support for hummingbird duos or for finch one or anything like that. We're gonna to continue to support those. Um, we're gonna to continue to make components available for that. But I believe at some point this year, we are gonna stop selling like the classroom kits of hummingbird duo. So you can still get more controllers, more motors, more lights, more sensors, all that stuff. But we're not gonna sell them in like the classroom sets anymore. Um, just cause if you've already got duos, we want you to be able to replace and update anything that breaks or goes out of warranty or gets dunked in a swimming pool or whatever it is. Um, but, but anybody who's just getting into hummingbirds, um, the, the bit is just a, a better product. It can do more, it costs less, it's got a, um, some better support and better packaging, things like that. So um, we'll continue to support the duo into the future though. But yeah, Erin, you had some. Yeah, I was just gonna add to the conversation. Um, Thank you. Stacy made some good points there. Um, one of the, the thing, one of the really cool moments I had with a student um, was, um, I don't have, there's not many other teachers using robotics um, in classes, but I actually, a student who had taken my robotics class um, was in a science class doing a project, and she, she loved the class so much and wanted to incorporate it that she came to me and was doing a project with tectonic plates, and so she ended up um, borrowing one of the hummingbird kits and making a robotic um, model of her tectonic plate shifting. And I thought it was just the coolest thing because she, it was her motivation. Like she came to me, asked about it. We worked together during study halls on it. Um, but that was really cool that, that even if teachers aren't using it, just trying to get kids inspired um, to want to use it, I thought was a, it was a really cool moment. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, to that note, I think one of the things that I also, like one of the, the pieces of research that like got me on the hummingbird train like five years ago when I was teaching with it was this piece of research that talked about like student talents and um, teachers' views of their students' capabilities. So in this research, they had um, asked teachers before they did a project with Hummingbird, please rank your students, like one through five, how good do you think they're gonna be at these things? Do you think they're gonna be good at this computational thinking thing, like, et cetera? And then they asked those, those same teachers to rank those same students after they had done the Hummingbird project. And these teachers, it wasn't measuring how much the students had improved, it was measuring what the teachers thought of the students, what the teachers thought the students were capable of. And they thought that, they, they said that the, um, the, some of the students in those lowest, in like the lowest five, 10%, they jumped into like the middle. Like these teachers who thought that these struggling students, they're really not gonna do very well with this they jumped up into the middle. Like they, they thought that those students were just as capable as everybody else. And some of those really high achieving students that they thought were just gonna mm -hmm. sail through this experienced they struggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think when we talk about differentiation in the classroom, um, we talk about how do we support those struggling learners? How do we support those gifted learners? When you've got, I mean, in my seventh grade English classroom, I had a kid reading on a second grade level and I had a kid reading at the AP level. And I was just like, well, I don't know what to tell you. One of you is going to be bored. Like that, I think, is one of the hardest things to do in the classroom. And I think when you can find a tool that lets struggling students, students who know how to struggle and persevere, when it gives them a place for their perseverance to pay off, and if you can find a tool that allows those gifted students to struggle in a safe way, you know, not, not unnecessary struggle, but like authentic struggle, man, like that was something that really clicked for me when I was teaching after school. So, so to your point, Erin, like you can um, encourage some of those talents that you never would have seen in students 
Um, and it can be an avenue for them to then use in other classes and, and pursue those passions. Yeah. Well, let me give you guys a quick preview of what we're going to do next week so you know what some of the projects are coming up. We're going to, this was one of the very first projects we did. It was the very first webinar we did on a Friday, like three weeks ago, which feels so long ago now. It's like quarantine time is like different. I saw a meme today that was like one year or one hour here is like seven days on earth. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and yet time also passes so quickly. It's, and, and it's we've attended more PD than you could ever imagine in the past three years. I didn't know I could learn that much in three weeks. That is exactly how I feel, Stacy. Yes, thank you. Um, but so this was just three weeks ago. Um, but this little box puppet here, it's got a little pulley. It's got, um, if we kind of go to the top down here, it's got a string that's pulling the mouth open and then it's got a rubber band that's going through the box to pl pull the mouth closed. This is my, you can see what my quarantine snack has been. I am not ashamed, I am proud. Um, but so we're gonna be making this box puppet and similar to the format of the two this week, um, we're gonna be investigating this box puppet, making that together, and then coding a version of that. So we'll have some robotic versions of that and kids will get to engage in remote coding, which if you haven't tuned in this week, remote coding means that you, from wherever you are around the country or around the world, can program a robot that I have in my studio right here in Pittsburgh live. So you can push the keys on your keyboard or move your mouse around and you can control um, the robots that we have here in the studio. Not move your mouse around, that was, you can use your mouse to move blocks around and recode it to do something else. Um, so, so far we've coded some uh, robot petting zoo animals, some robot parade floats, which is actually on Thursday, I don't have anything to show you for this because Matt and I just um, thought it up. But next Thursday, we, we were gonna do robot parade floats again, which was really fun, and I'm sure that we will do that one again. But what we're gonna do on Thursday, we're gonna try a little different format, where the thing that we're gonna make at home is gonna be a, a rover, like a, uh, or a racer. Um, this is gonna be a little bit inspired by the Engineering is Everywhere curriculum from the Museum of Science Boston. Um, they do this recycled racers thing, which is like, get some recycled materials, make a little car, test out and see how far it can go and how fast it can go and what happens when the back wheels are bigger. And it's an awesome um, curriculum that I used to teach at my old job. Um, but, uh, so we're gonna be kind of inspired by that. I'm gonna have a, a racer made out of recycled material and the people tuning in are gonna suggest what I could change about it to make it go further or faster, etc. So you may have, you may build along at home with us, but we find that people tuning in from different places have vastly different stuff available to them. Um, so for this one, we're gonna try this thing where we, we build a thing and the people on the Zoom call can suggest ways to what would happen if the wheels were different, if the axle was placed up higher or down lower, etc. And then, over, we have this separate studio space over there. We are gonna build a maze, and we're gonna make a little rover out of um, recycled materials, and we're going to place the camera kind of in this top-down situation, and we're gonna have a cardboard maze that you, remote programming from home, are going to have to navigate the rover through with your arrow keys. So that, I'm so excited for that on Thursday. Um, now that I've said it out loud, we actually have to do it. <laughs> so, good luck to us. Well, That's our... We're going to all lose to all the children in the class, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the kids will be much better at this than all of us. So I want you to prepare to lose. <laughs> um, hey, hey, Kelsey, before yeah. you, you wrap it up, just really quickly, I, having attended a whole bunch of your, your and Matt's classes this past week, um, don't, don't forget... Uh, if you haven't attended these before, to your students can. Yeah. And so I'm going to put out a um, an email um, with my students and say, hey, join um, this crying online with this wonderful um, these wonderful teachers, and they can code remotely. That's the cool thing is that they're who ran out the door when you went into to to stay home orders with your kids, but this way the kids can program at home and see it running live. Exactly. Thank you, Stacy. That, that means a lot. I'm so glad that you've been coming to so many and that they're so useful to you. But yeah, these workshops on Tuesdays and Thursdays are for teachers and students and parents. They're for anybody who wants to try 
a thing. <laughs> Whether or not you have a hummingbird kit, you can make along with us and then code along with us and your code can actually do something here in the studio. So please, teachers, if you're, if you're finding these out, please um, share out our webinars that we're doing. They're free to attend. You do have to register. I know there are some, some security concerns that people have been experiencing with Zoom, but we have a system to keep everybody secure, which is you have to register with an email address um, and then when we let people in, they go to a waiting room when they come to Zoom, and we only let people in who have registered, who are legitimate people with like uh, an address and they've communicated with us, so we have a vetting process so that nobody gets in who shouldn't be here. And um, if we kick anybody out, they can't come back in. Um, it's, a, it's a good system that makes it much more secure for, for us so that nobody can come into these meetings who's not supposed to be here. Um, so please, teachers, if you're interested in sharing this as an optional resource or you could do something. I had a teacher last week who asked her students to come to the class or watch it live on Facebook and then make their own version of the thing and then send her a video of that and that was their assignment for the day. Your assignment for the day is to watch this video and make your own and show me a picture. And that was their, that was their, their project for the day. And um, that I was, I was very honored that a teacher had, had trusted us with her students like that. I was, that felt like really nice. So yes, please, um, teachers, share us with your kiddos because we would really like to meet them. <laughs> we, Matt is giggling. What are you giggling about, Matt? Uh, Something. Okay, Matt's getting about other things. Okay, uh, I thought maybe we got a comment from Facebook or something. Um, so, um, did you guys have anything else that you wanted to cover while while we're here today on this lovely Friday day? No. Well, thank you so much, all all of you wonderful teachers, for joining in this 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 session was what it was because you guys were here and had so many great ideas and, and input. So please come back next Tuesday. I think next week it's actually going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, because um, I have some professional development I'm doing with a school on Thursday that's been planned for six months, which is fun. Um, but so Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday of next week. Tuesday, Wednesday will be building and coding. Friday will be teacher talks like this. So thank you all so much to you teachers for tuning in and contributing. I really appreciate you. All right. I will end the meeting there. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Round of <laughs> Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> all right. Bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see what you make on social media. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you can tag at birdbraintech or hashtag hummingbirdkit, or you can even tag me. If you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. We can answer questions about purchasing, about learning, about teaching, and about professional development. If you haven't been there yet, be sure to visit our Robotics at Home page. There, you can purchase a kit for yourself, learn how to use it, and even join one of our upcoming webinars. Until we see you in class, thanks for watching from everyone at BirdBrain Technologies.